Hebrews chapter 1. I only have to preach tonight. I don't have to preach all day. So we'll be just fine. I don't need a microphone. I have plenty of natural volume. But on Sundays I do because I usually speak about four or five times on Sundays. And then I can't help but sing in the song services. And that's what, that's what puts me over usually. It's, uh, so anyway, Hebrews chapter 1 tonight. And I'll try to be uh, loud enough that you can hear me. And if you can't hear me, <laughs> there you go. Tonight we're going to begin reading in verse 4. And we're going to read down to the end of chapter 1 about Jesus being made so much better than the angels, as He hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said He at any time, Thou art My Son, this day have I begotten Thee. And again, <clears throat> I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in our beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? And then we will read verses 1 and 2, or 1 through 3 of chapter 2. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? the which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard Him. Now we'll stop there <coughs> this evening in this first warning passage of Hebrews. Let's pray. Now God, please help us tonight with the understanding that we need. And God, I pray that this evening that literally our souls would be thrilled with who the person of Jesus Christ is along with the access that we have to Him. And at the same time this evening that, that we're impressed with who Jesus Christ is and how He is much better than the angels. May we be impressed with how undeserving we are who are lower than the angels to even have access to Him. And Lord, may we find great conviction when it is that we would turn away from Him as though there were something about us that makes Christ not good enough. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Is Jesus good enough? Is Jesus good enough? You know, to ask the question and to simply answer the question, you couldn't overstate Christ's worthiness, could you? No, In other words, if you were to say, Jesus Christ is as worthy as, and you are tasked with the descriptive responsibility, you're supposed to describe Jesus in a way that is fitting to Him. You know, sometimes I just have to uh, go with understatements that are so obviously understatements that they do the job better than saying things as well as I could. You know what I'm talking about? For instance, in, in, the, in the chapter here we see that Jesus Christ is being made much better than the angels. And sometimes I'll just say about God, He's better than. He's more than. He's, he's gooder than. He's, he's more gooder uh, than. And you know, I just don't know a way to describe God's goodness. You know, when I try to understand the scope 
of the character and the nature of God in any aspect, I realize that you cannot accurately state what God is because He is so much better than. And so superlatives are about the best that we can do. Just to say Christ is better than the angels. Let's lay the groundwork a little bit, bring ourselves alongside. Perhaps you weren't with us last week when we began our introduction of this letter to the Hebrews. It's important for us to remember the context. And the context is that this letter is written or penned by whom? Paul. <laughs> Brother John says Paul. Yeah, that's what my Bible says, Paul. Uh, <clears throat> I'm of the opinion that's a good chance that Paul wrote the letter to the Hebrews, but very, very deliberately the Holy Spirit left the author unnamed yes. so that Jesus Christ could have the glory, so He could be the most referred to, the most understood. And in a letter where we see Jesus Christ being compared to Moses, being compared to Melchizedek, being compared to the angels, being compared with the high priest, being compared uh, with all the different individuals, we oftentimes are reminded or, or we're continuously reminded that Jesus Christ is superior to every single comparison. And so for a person to have personality in a letter that's supposed to be all about lifting up Jesus and saying Jesus is better than anything or anybody, if for a person uh, to be named or mentioned would be a distraction, wouldn't it? And friend, we as believers ought to just learn a good solid lesson here about getting out of the way sometimes. Getting out of the way of Jesus Christ and Christ being lifted up. And we ought to not mind so much when we're not recognized. I just love how that, uh, that this study that we're in right now corresponds with the time period where we're studying the Gospel of John and we're looking at the life and ministry of John the Baptist, whose ministry mantra ended up being, He must increase, I must decrease. John, you're in prison, you're languishing. You were great just a few short weeks ago, and now this one who's come after you, who is preferred before you, has completely surpassed you. John, you're a nobody now. Man, I'll tell you something. Being nobody hurts our feelings, doesn't it? You're nothing! You're nobody! Man, the soonest you could get to the place and you'd say, Amen! That's right, I'm nothing. That's right, I'm nobody. But I know Jesus. And He's everything. And He's everybody. And if I were anything at all, I'd be a distraction from people looking at me instead of looking at Jesus. Friend, get over yourself. Get over seeing everything from your perspective and begin to see things from His perspective. You won't mind if people uh, don't notice or if people mistreat or people disregard. And that's the whole point of the unnamed authorship of Hebrews. I, it might have been Priscilla, it might have been Paul, it might have been Luke. You don't know who it was because Jesus is the point. In other words, we want to talk about Jesus. And it's incredible, isn't it, that more books are written about who wrote Hebrews than are written about Jesus in Hebrews. You know why they don't write a lot of books about the superiority of Christ in Hebrews? There are some. You know why that isn't the focus of most of what's written? because it's the plain and simply understood truth in the book and you don't have to expound much on something that's stated and means what it says. You know what I find about false doctrine and false religions? The more stretching you are to prove something, the more words it takes to do it, the more books that have to be written to do it. And uh, the, <laughs> I'll just tell you, the more you have to write to defend a purpose, I mean, a, 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 to defend a, a doctrine, to defend a point of view, a perspective, probably the more that it's just not defensible in the Scripture. And so the clear sense in Hebrews is that this is a letter written to Jewish believers who are struggling with, uh, struggling with going forward in their faith. And they've responded to persecution. They've responded to difficulty. They've kind of burned out spiritually. And they've responded by going back to the religion that they were saved from. They've responded by going back into Judaism. Now you'd ask the question, why are angels mentioned so much? More mentioned more and discussed more in Hebrews than they are anywhere else. We don't talk about angels in other portions of the Scripture. We simply reference them. This angel or that angel or an angel appeared. We see what messengers do. We don't talk about the messengers. Well, the reasons it's referenced so much is because uh, Judaism has lifted up and exalted angelic beings so much that part of going back into Judaism is going back into knowing the names of all the angels and having an angel named for everything. By the way, Catholicism is identical. 
Catholicism does the very same thing. I used to have in my truck, and I never threw it away for some reason, but I used to have a, an old uh, GMC truck, ended up having, I think, almost 420,000 miles on it, and uh, had an old diesel GMC truck, and the person that had it before me, it was ragged out when I got it, but the person that had it before me uh, had a pen in there that said, keep daddy safe or something like that, and had an angel on it, it had a guardian angel to fly along. Mike, you remember that being in my truck? <clears throat> yeah. So you never threw it away either, did you? Well, too bad. Anyway, but it used to be in the truck. And, uh, you know, it was a, probably, a, uh, probably a Catholic thing. But it could have been Judaism because the Jews have been into angels. They're just big time into angels. Got names for angels and they always want to talk about angels. And the truth of the matter is, is that anytime you're in a religion that does not exalt Jesus himself, you have to exalt saints and exalt angels. And that's what a Hebrew Christian would be going back to. They would be going back to angels which were given responsibilities and, and, and powers, if you will, over limited areas, but Jesus is unlimited. So you'd be going from a Christ who's everything. A name for me, an idol, if you will. An idol, if you will, first of all, that is love. I'm not talking about uh, I'm not talking about passion kind of love. I'm talking about sacrifice kind of love. And a God or an idol that you don't sacrifice to, but sacrifices for you. You can't. There isn't any such thing in religion. Religion always requires you to sacrifice for the idol. Now, sacrifice your children. Sacrifice your money. Sacrifice your family. Sacrifice your wealth. You sacrifice for your God and then you'll appease Him. And He won't destroy you. Or He'll give you something to reward you for your sacrifice. But Jesus sacrificed Himself. He was our Passover lamb. God sacrificed His Son. You know, every idol and every angel, every deity that's made up, every supernatural being has powers, if you will, over things. Powers over the weather. Uh, powers over... Uh, personalities and powers over kingdoms. They have powers and they're limited, but God is unlimited in His power. He's everything. He's overall. And so here we are given an argument which seems to us to seem a little bit ludicrous, but the argument that we began with, which concludes with a warning, is that you shouldn't go back from following Jesus because He's better than the angels. That's just the argument in a nutshell. Look at verse 4 again, will you please? Being made so much better than the angels. Could I have said it better? <laughs> Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Than, than they. Now I remind you that the Scripture is not here saying that Jesus Christ had a beginning. We know in verse 2 that the Bible says that Jesus, or God, hath in these last days appointed us by, or spoken to us by His Son, whom He hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds. Jesus existed before creation existed. Jesus Christ did not begin when He was born of a virgin. He came to be born of a virgin. In Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 4, when the Bible talks about who hath, talks about who hath, what is it, uh, created the, the heavens, who hath uh, bound the waters in a garment and uh, something in His fists. What is His name and what is His Son's name? if thou canst tell. Now, it's a terrible misquote, but you can go to Proverbs chapter 30, verses 4 through 6, and read it accurately if you'd like to. I could quote it this morning, but I can't tonight. It's too late in the day for me. My mind slips as the day goes on. But the reality of it is, is that Jesus Christ is pre-existent, pre-eternal God. And His assignment or His position in the Godhead is that He has a more excellent name than the angels. Okay, so He's much better and He's more excellent. You see the description here. Now, Christian, listen to me. You say, Pastor, I'd never worship an angel instead of Jesus. My friend, any time you go away from devotion to Jesus, then you respond by something else having the place of worship. Idolatry is just that. I think sometimes, you know, we, uh, we, we, we don't explain idolatry very well. So as we say, well, idolatry is, you know, if you have a nice car and you're polishing that car. Well, you know, God can, you can have a nice car and not worship a nice car. Can't you? You have a classic. You can, you can uh, love it, but not love it in the wrong way. Not love it in a way that you shouldn't love God. You could have a nice house if God wants you to have a nice house. 
having a nice house doesn't mean you have an idol. Uh, loving to have a nice house doesn't mean you love it, but if you love it in the wrong way, if you love it instead of God. But there anything that takes the place of Jesus in our affections, anything that takes the place of Jesus in our worship, and practically speaking, if you were to jump ahead and read chapter 10, you would see what had happened is that the Hebrew Christians had actually forsaken the assembly. They'd actually gone away from being involved as being part of Christ's bride, the church, and they'd left the church for angels. We're going to see other things they left the church for, but that's what you leave for. You say, Pastor, you know, I wouldn't leave Jesus for anything. Well, listen, if you're not devoted to Jesus, you've left for something. But specifically for the Hebrew Christians, it was this affinity or fixation for angelic beings. They loved angelic beings and they just, you know, I've met Christians that say, you know, Pastor, I miss the formalism of the high church. I met people that got saved out of Catholicism and they say, I miss, I don't, I think it's spooky, to be honest with you. It seems demonic. When I, anytime, I, I don't mean to insult you Catholics here, but uh, I just think Catholicism is the closest thing to demonic uh, that can possibly be. Those idols that are supposed to be saints represent devils. Greek Orthodox. Yeah, any any of the organized religious, uh, so-called Christian religion, it, it, it's satanic, it's demonic. And I don't mean to be mean or abrasive about it. that's just the, that's that's the fact. <laughs> it's just what it is. And not only that, but it's spooky to me. But I've met people that say, you know, Pastor, I just like the, I just feel, I just feel so peaceful and so calm when I go into those. You know, they're talking about the cathedral type buildings and how formal it is, and and do they like that? And I don't. Some people do, and I think they could probably relate a little bit more to wanting to go back to worshiping angels. And again, I'm not picking on, I'm not picking out a group of people to pick on. I'm trying to illustrate so we can relate to it because, truthfully, not many of us are acquainted with individuals that worship or acknowledge angels more than Jesus. But it exists today in Judaism, it exists today in Catholicism, and all the other isms. And when you go into those, you say, you know, Pastor, I know I'm saved. But you know, my family is part of the Catholic Church and I just want to keep going there. You know, is that going to be alright if I just keep going to the Catholic Church? Now, I met, I met believers that say nonsensical things like if you attend a Catholic Church, you're not saved. You don't know who's saved and who isn't. God does. Amen. You don't know. I don't pretend to know that. I just tell people it just confuses me a lot. It just confuses me a lot. I mean, you're going to a place where something that is taught that the gospel is something other than Christ alone for salvation. And I'm a little bit confused about what you believe when you go there. Now, the Holy Spirit in Hebrews is not saying if you've gone back into Judaism, you're not saved. That's not what He's saying here. That's right. What He's saying is that Jesus Christ is better than the angels. Which of the angels did He at any time say the things to that He said about Jesus? Now, He references, and I love this, and I think that I find this a real help. They've gone back into rejecting uh, the apostles. Uh, that's one of the reasons we don't see Paul an apostle, the Lord Jesus Christ, for an introduction here. If they've gone back into Judaism, if they've gone back into uh, attending and uh, worshiping God uh, through Judaism, which is not what is prescribed in the Old Testament, by the way, but if they've gone back into that system, even though they're saved, my friend, appealing to them by the authority of an apostle doesn't have much appeal to them. Because they rejected that foundational uh, part, the, the, the establishing of the church and the foundational gift to the church, which is the apostles. They rejected the church. By the way, Messianic Judaism today does the very same thing that Hebrews rejects everywhere. Uh, you know, a Messianic Jew won't be teaching Hebrews. Well, they won't be teaching the New Testament at all in the synagogues. And so the Holy Spirit, in a sense, and I don't take this the wrong way, but in a sense, the Holy Spirit of God panders a little bit to the attitude that these individuals who have substituted inferior angel worship for the true worship of Jesus Christ, who substituted Judaism for being part of Christ's church. And He appeals to them on the thing that would still have an appeal, and that's the Old Testament of the Scripture. The rest of chapter 1, he quotes the Old Testament Scripture. Now let me stop here and let me just make a qualifying statement. Don't get extreme about anything. Sometimes I'll share something and I'll feel it and I'll say it so passionately that people will go out and say, well, you don't ever preach the Gospel from the Old Testament. You know, Pastor Price says win people. Well, I believe that. I don't think, I don't think there's any help 
in cutting you, the foundation of the gospel out from you, the place where the gospel clarifies who Jesus Christ is, the New Testament, the Scripture. You could preach Jesus from the Old Testament, though. I'm not saying you can't preach Jesus from the Old Testament. I'm just saying that the gospel is clear and simple in the New Testament, the Scripture. And I'm bothered by organizations which try to reach people and, and, and take the New Testament, the Scripture, away from you in doing it. You know, we're going to preach the Isaiah trail instead of the Romans road kind of uh, mentality. You know what I'm talking about this evening? Okay, but having said that, the Holy Spirit here preaches Old Testament to people that are trying to go back to the Old Testament, if you will. Now, not that the Old Testament is that much. Judaism means more to them than the, the Old Testament Scripture, but we give them a healthy dose of Scripture that they must acknowledge. For instance, Psalm chapter 2 and verse 7. Uh, go ahead and find Psalms in your Bible. Uh, the Psalms because we'll be there uh, for, for quite a little bit of time in the next several minutes, so it won't be a waste of your time to go over there, but we'll just come right back. Um, uh, chapter uh, 2 of Psalm, mm -hmm. and uh, let's just read verse 7. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my Son, capital S, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me. I love it when missionaries quote this verse. Don't you love when missionaries quote Psalm 2.8? Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. How many of y'all heard missionaries say that? They never read verse 8, do they? Thou shalt uh, break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And so I asked missionaries, anytime they quote Psalm 2.7, the, the mischievous mean person in me always ask him so are you you going to you going to dash him in pieces with a, a rod of iron you're going to break them like a potter's vessel you're going to go over there and smash up the heathen knock some heads is that what you're for <laughs> and they take that verse pretty far from its context don't they this is not a verse to missionaries this is a verse to the son of god and this is speaking of future judgment when he's going to judge the wicked and rule with a rod of iron and it's going to be unbending and it's going to be uh, righteous indignation and anger. We don't preach the gospel that way, do we? That's not, that's not the gospel. That's not the way we preach the gospel. But who was being referenced here? David? I'm going to give you the heathen for your inheritance. David said, oh, that's just what I've always wanted for Christmas. The heathen. No. Who is it referring to in Psalm chapter 2? Verse 7. It's, it's, it's referring to Jesus. Now, did Jesus ever say that? Did God ever say that to the angels? You're going to have the heathen for an inheritance. Angels ever inherit anything? Ever get called? They ever have that stature? That stature? You're going to worship angels. Consider that Jesus is the one who's going to inherit the earth, not the angels. So you're worshiping something that's not going to, or you're worshiping individuals that don't have anything by way of inheritance. There's no part that you can partake with their inheritance. What does it mean to be a partaker and heir together with Jesus Christ? I can scarce wrap my mind around it. I have a hard time when the Bible talks about <coughs> we who are a little lower than the angels ruling over them. I, I have a tough time with that. That's a tough one for me, but it's a fact. It's a fact and it's our future. Let me ask you a question. You want to swap? You want to worship angels instead of worshiping a Jesus who's going to rule with a rod of iron? Not on your life, my friend. That's not a good trade. You need some help with tra trading. You know, you're like the little kid that doesn't know the value of a dollar and he trades it for, you know, a nickel because it's heavier. You know, you're like a person that trades a nickel for a dime because it's bigger. You know, uh, you've got to be careful about that sort of thing. Better educate yourself some. You know what I mean? trade a, one of those newer small uh, dollar pieces for a 50 cent piece because you don't know the value of the thing. Friend, I'm going to tell you something. You better know the worth of the blood of Jesus Christ. You know the worth of the blood of Jesus Christ. And whatever you trade it for won't be worth it. And for these individuals, they're going back into angel worship. They're going back into exalting and knowing the names of angels and having an angel for this and an angel for that. Because they like it, it makes them feel good, makes them feel comfortable, and they put this angel in the corner of their house and keep him there and it'll make them feel safe. And they don't have to go anywhere to feel safe. They don't have to go to the church house and worship. They don't have to do anything. They like this angel, and the angel can't do anything at all for him because he's a created being in Jesus Christ. 
is the Creator. That's the contrast that we've seen here. Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. And again, the Scripture says, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. If you take notes or if you jot down Scripture references, this is 2 Samuel chapter 7 and 1 Chronicles chapter 17 and uh, verse 13. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 7 and read those verses there. If you turn back a few, if you want to stay in Proverbs, that's alright, we'll be back there sometime if, if uh, we don't end before we're finished. We might end before we're finished. That happens sometimes. 2 Samuel chapter 7. I like to read down uh, beginning in verse 12. This is a promise to David after God had given him rest in his kingdom. And when the days thy days shall be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. <clears throat> now is this talking about Solomon? Well, let's look. <coughs> he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Well, we're talking about Solomon, we're talking about building a house, aren't we? But we're not talking about Solomon, we're talking about forever, because Solomon's not around anymore. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chastise him with the rod of man, and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. Now notice verse 16. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established, established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Now the question is, is it David who's eternal here? No. Who is the forever establishment of the throne of David? Well, Jesus Christ. Who is that fulfillment of the promise of the eternal throne uh, uh, for the kingdom of David? You know, they've lost track today, haven't they? You know, there are people that make up lies, tell you they know who, that they know who you know the descendants of King David are today, but that's a lie. They don't know. They don't know that. There are a lot of, uh, of religious myths to try to draw people away from worshiping the Messiah in Judaism. One of the myths is, you know, the temple's ready. You know, we're ready. As soon as things work out to reestablish, you know, all the furniture for the temple is already made and all these things. You say, Pastor, you don't believe the furniture for the temple is made? It doesn't matter a bit to me if it is. It doesn't matter at all because God's not going to inhabit it. He's not going to go there. Uh, we, we know where Christ's throne is going to be. You say, there's going to be a, a temple in the millennium? Yeah, there will. And the folks that are tampering right now won't have anything to do with that. It's not going to be them. And uh, God can use their descendants. He, he'll, he will use their descendants, but they're not the ones. And God can raise up. God can raise up from stones. God can raise up from anything, from any people. People that will worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so the significance here is not David. The significance here is that David was promised a seed that would be established forever, and that seed was Jesus Christ. What angel did God say to you, your throne will be established forever? You want to worship angels? What angel has an eternal throne? What angel has an eternal kingdom? What angel has an eternal uh, reign? You say, Pastor, you're kind of hard on angels tonight. Well, the Hebrews kind of does a little angel bashing here, so we're just going to jump on the angel bashing bandwagon. And I have a little fun with it tonight. I'm not picking on angels tonight. I'm picking on the worship of angels. And anyone who worships anything other than Jesus Christ is a fool. Amen. Amen. And that's what the Hebrews, the letter of the Hebrews, is trying to get across for us here this evening. Want to worship angels? Well, which of the angels did he say, I've begotten thee, you're my son? Which of the angels did he say to them, I'm going to be to you a father, and you're going to be to me a son, your kingdom's going to be established forever? Not a single one of the angels, but Jesus is the Son of God. So don't worship an angel instead of the Son of God. Worship the Son. Again, when he bringeth in the first begotten in the world, he saith, Let all the angels of God worship him. If the angels are worshiping Jesus, I'm a fool to worship an angel. Amen. Every time an angel appeared to a man and a man tried to worship him, what did the angel say? Get up. Fear God. Get up. Don't worship. I don't worship me. I'm like you are. I worship God. Don't worship me. Every time, every time a believer saw an angelic being, man, they fell down on their face. Oh, watch out, it's an angel. The angel said, Don't fall on your face for me. Worship God. That was their response. Don't make the mistake of worshiping angels instead of worshiping Jesus. Um, that's also found in uh, chapter Deuteronomy 32, 43 and Psalm 97, 7. I don't have time for that, but I want to go to verse 
8, and while I'm reading verse 8, will you please turn in your copy of the Scripture to Psalm 45, and verse, and we'll look at uh, several verses there. But under the sun, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of Thy kingdom. And Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even Thy God, hath anointed Thee with the oil of gladness above Thy fellows. You in Psalm 45? Let's look down at verses 6 and 7. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of Thy kingdom is a, is a right sepulcher, scepter. I almost said sepulcher. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And of course there's more to read about that. And the truth of the matter is, is that no human king is being referenced here but the Son of God. And the question is, did God promise a scepter of righteousness? Did God make these promises uh, uh, about uh, being anointed with oil above thy fellows to any of the angels? No, my friend, any angel that would be worshipped rather than God is a usurper or a supplanter like the Satan himself. Any angel that would be worshipped before God is a usurper or a supplanter like Satan himself. And so don't worship an angel. If you're worshipping an angel, can I give you a guess? Can I give you a guess on where your worship's heading, where it's going? It's probably not an angel in heaven. It's probably not an angel representing God because no angel representing God would ever receive worship. And so you're worshiping a devil. You're worshiping a devil. And that's not superior. You say, Pastor, who are they worshiping when they talk about angels in the synagogues today? Devils. Devils. Who are they worshiping when they worship angels in Catholicism today? Devils. They're worshiping angels. Who are they worshiping in the Baptist church when they start talking about this angel and that angel and glorifying guardian angels like they can do what only Jesus can do? Like they're anything more than a representative for Christ Himself? Devils. Devils. The devil's real. We better be careful about misplaced worship because it always heads his direction. The mis misplaced worship always goes the devil's direction. Uh, did we? Uh, let's go to Psalm chapter 102. Can you, can you turn there? You say, Pastor, man, you've been going way too long tonight. Yeah, I'm having fun. Uh, Psalm 102. Psalm 102. And uh, let's, uh, let's, let's look down uh, quite a ways. I'm going to read the verses, verses 10 and 11 in our text this evening. Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old, as doth the garment. You know, I can understand individuals who appreciate the beauty of the creation. Matter of fact, I'd say that most of us fall in that category. I don't know if there's anything I'd rather do than get someplace where nobody else is and just admire God's creation. <clears throat> and just there, that is one of the play, one of the things that leads me to worship more naturally than anything else. Isn't it true for you? You ever seen a sunrise or a sunset in stillness and not naturally wanted to just say, "God, your creation is wow." I just go, "Wow." If that's what that looks like and God made it, what must God be like? Now that's what it leads me to, but there are folks that won't worship God, but they worship creation. They get it all backwards. And they won't worship God, but they'll worship angels, and they're backwards about it. They want to talk about angelic beings. So you're in Psalm chapter 102, look down with you made it to verse 25. Of old thou hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. By the way, you ever wonder why the earth was created with age? You ever wonder why the earth looks old? It's because it's created with age, I should say. The Bible says that, explains yeah. that. And uh, verse 26, but the Bible says, as old as the earth is, it's got an ending. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Now friend, if you worship an angel, and it's not uh, an angel representing God, which no angel which would receive your worship would be, what's going to happen to those angels that don't worship God? They'll perish. They'll perish. You worship the earth. You worship the creation more than the Creator. What's going to happen to the creation? Well, it's been made from old. But it's going to wax old. It's going to perish like a garment does. Y'all ever had that worn out pair of Levi jeans? You know, you don't want to... My wife, my wife kills clothing. By that, I mean, I kill the clothing, but my wife, my wife eliminates killed clothing. I'm talking about. It's always like, are you? You still want this all the time? My best clothes. You still want this? Do do we still need this? Do you wear this? 
Yes, you can't wear that is how it goes to the next level. Like, you, you can't wear that anymore. I tell her, sew it up. Put some, you know how terrible that'll look. I say, it'll look wonderful. Just put it in there. You know, garment wax is old. Jesus Christ used uh, the, the sewing new cloth in an old garment illustration. Remember that? In the New Testament. You know, you take, a, take a, a, an old pair of clothing uh, and put uh, non-pre-shrunken... Uh, by the way, the answer to it is just sew old material in old garments. It works just fine. Okay, but you know, you put new material in an old garment, and then the new material you wash it and it goes crack like this, and, and it rips it rips out the old, tears it out because of its shrinking. And so uh, the Bible says that the heavens, the earth, they're going to wax old like a garment does, and they're going to perish away. Don't worship the earth, my friend, because you're worshiping something that is temporary. You say, Pastor, the earth's been around a lot longer than I have. Yes, it has, but you're going to be around a lot longer than it is. See, it's got more experience right now, but the day will come when you'll have existed for longer than this world. Think on that. Think on that. This earth, as we know, it's something like 7,000 years old. Uh, this, and, uh, you know, I could, I could give you the exact minute and date because Joel will always want to know that. But I could tell you the minute that, not really, that the earth was, <laughs> was created, I could make up something for you as, uh, with, as regards to the beginning of the earth. The day will come when this individual whose body right now is waxing old like a garment, the day will come that I'll have lived longer than this earth lasted. Think on that. Don't worship the earth instead of Jesus. Don't worship the creation more than Jesus because it's passing, it's fleeting, it's vanishing. But Jesus is not. And in contrast to that, the Bible says, uh, they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. That's verse uh, verse 27, Thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. You know what? Go ahead and go with the lasting thing. How many of y'all uh, have seen things come and go? Y'all remember Wolko? Sears seems to be going the way of that nowadays. Uh, you remember the catalog? The J.C. Penney catalog? Remember the Sears catalog? You know, it's really funny when people, you talk about ordering out a catalog, and kids ask you, what's a catalog? <laughs> they don't even go to libraries and know what a catalog is, you know. What well, you know? What's a phone book? <laughs> There's been memes all week on rotary dial, like millennials trying to dial rotary phones and trying to figure out, you know, what kind of a sound they're supposed to make for each number. You know, the reality of it is, though, my friend, things come, things go, but Jesus is always the same. Amen. And you can worship angels, and you can get with the latest religious fad or trend. But the reality of it is, is that Jesus Christ is going to endure forever. His throne is forever. He's not. His years are not going to fail. How much has Jesus changed in the last two thousand years? Not an iota. How much has Jesus changed in the last seven thousand years? How much will Jesus be different five thousand years from now? Uh, uh, Ten thousand years. A hundred thousand years. He's unchanging. And my friend, you just got to admire something that's unchanged. You know, one of the things I admire in ministry more than anything else is lasting or unchanging. Last Sunday morning, we had a couple visiting with us and they, they go to a church that's a couple hundred years old. A Baptist church up in Kentucky. And it's a couple hundred years old. And I said, that's just cool. That they, can, they, they know who the first pastor of the church was and the messages that he preached and there's records of it. And it was a good church 200 years ago and it's a good church today and that's just wonderful, isn't it? Yeah. I love the Rices. You know one of the reasons I like about the Rices? I watch Christians. You know, I watch them. I watch them over the years change. Or I watch their kids change. And I, I realize, man, you know, over the years, they're not the same as, as they were some years ago. I was listening to Erwin Lutzer on the radio today, and, and uh, I'm not bashing Erwin Lutzer. I, 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 I think uh, positive things about him sometimes. So don't take me the wrong way here. But he was kind of saying that his ministry is greater than that of D.L. Moody in a... In a and an underhanded, and sort of, uh, not, not directly, but he said, you know, our ministry to children is better than D.L. Moody could ever even, even imagine. And I'm thinking, no. I read about D.L. Moody before, and maybe they embellished him somewhat, but I don't think anybody's reaching kids like D.L. Moody did back sure. in the day. Uh, you know, and sometimes things change and people change, and I don't think, I don't think Moody Church is the same as it was when D.L. Moody was alive. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's better. Than it was when he's like. Matter of fact, things usually don't get better over time, do they? They usually kind of, they kind of uh, degrade. They downgrade a little bit, but not Jesus. 
Not Jesus. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus never changes. And so we see that Jesus is better than the angel because of His eternality, because He's not created, because He doesn't get old, because He has sonship, He's God's Son, because He's worthy to be worshipped. We see Jesus is better for all these reasons. And then we're asked the question, if you'll find Psalm 110, I'll read it in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 13, to which of the angels said He at any time sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstools? Well, that's Psalm... <coughs> Psalm chapter 110. So if you'll find it quickly, we'll read it. And then I'll try to land here in just a little bit and we'll finish up tonight. Psalm 110 verse 1, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Will you please notice the spelling of Lord there? Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D is always Jehovah, Lord, Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And He said unto my Lord, small l o r or capital L, small O-R-D. Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And that's in the text. That's what, that's what uh, King David was moved by the Holy Spirit to pen specifically. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst <coughs> of thine enemies. Was God saying to David, sit, thou, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. I love it, the message Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. He said, is David saying that about himself or is he saying that about someone else? David's not saying the capital L-O-R-D about himself. He's saying about the Lord that he worships, Jehovah. And, uh, in, and uh, so which of the angels? What angel did, did uh, God say, sit on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool? Not a single angel ever, but he said about Jesus. And so we ask the final question, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? And this just draws the conclusion here. If angels are supposed to minister, that is to serve. We, we've abused the word minister so much in our era that uh, oftentimes we think of it as a title of prestige or of importance. But it isn't so. To minister is to be the servant of. To minister to be as at, at the beckoning, at the call of. A minister in our understanding with angels would be most akin to a genie in a bottle that had to do whatever you wished. You know, I like reading, uh, I think it's Huckleberry Finn, about uh, when Tom Sawyer tells him about a genie in a bottle and if you rub it, the, the, the genie's got to come out and he's big as a church and you can, you can make him do whatever you want. And Huck Finn says, if I was... Uh, if I was big as a church and you try to make me do whatever you want, I lay I'd lamb you. You know, I, <laughs> you, you try and make me. But you know, the fact is that angels, they're not bound in the ways that we are, but they are ministering spirits. And God made them to minister to whom? Us. Us. It is absolutely preponderous then for we who have been made for angels to minister unto to worship ministering spirits. That's ridiculous. You say, Pastor, humility is a good thing. You know, I'd like to think. I'd like to think that the motivation behind not worshiping Jesus but worshiping angels instead is humility. But that's preposterous as well, isn't it? No, it's preference over, over ease, simplicity, or convenience. But it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous to worship a ministering spirit when ministering spirits are sent to serve us. I don't even thank angels, and I don't mean to be unkind about it, but I thank God. You ever been spared? You ever, had, you ever been spared in a way you thought, man, something happened there. Somebody moved something. Try growing up in a junkyard sometime. How many times I've been spared? Not spare part. I'm talking about spared death. <laughs> I can tell you some stories all night. Somebody did something because I should have been dead. I didn't say, well, thank you, whoever you were. I said, thank you, Jesus. Because that's who I worship. And that's who I bestow gratitude upon. And if Jesus sent an angel, He did His duty. But I don't worship Him. Oh, you should be thankful for the angels. I'm thankful for Jesus sending angels. The angels don't represent themselves. They represent God. Unless they're devils. 
And if you're worshiping them, they're probably a devil. And so we see the warning, therefore, if all this is true, if Jesus Christ in every way is much better than the angels, therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. You ever slipped? You ever let them slip? You ever let them slip? You ever slipped? <laughs> We're slippers, aren't we? Not the kind to of go on a feet. But that's what we are. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, oh, let's bring it to our conclusion then. If the individuals that you're worshiping, if the steadfast word of God has delivered to them a just recompense and reward, what's their end? Where are the, where are the fallen angels going to be? What's their end? In hell. If the Word of God, the justice of God, is so steadfast that angels which have fallen away are going to receive a just recompense, a repayment, and reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Better look out. Better look out with your angel worshiping, angel watching, angel acknowledging, and Jesus rejecting. You could take the conclusion this evening and you could go a couple of directions with it. Don't go the wrong direction. Hebrews is not here in or in chapter 6 implying that a person who's received Jesus can lose their salvation. That's not the point of this passage of Scripture in the slightest. But it's a warning. It's a warning that underlying a bad behavior is a bad attitude. And that attitude reveals something that comes from where? What well, comes from a corrupted heart? Now, a believer can be corrupt, can't they? A believer can fall into sin, and a believer can have things that are they're in need of confessing and forsaking and asking God forgiveness for. Sometimes it might be that a believer is confused, or an unbeliever is confused and thinks that they're a believer, but when you identify what you believe, you realize it wasn't Jesus. And if anything other than Jesus is the object of your faith, my friend, you're not a believer. Amen. If anything, hear me now, anything other than Jesus is the object of your faith, you're not a believer. Pastor, it bothers me how you bashed angels tonight. Shouldn't bother you too much. Shouldn't bother you too much. It bothers me that you're bothered by it. And I mean that. Not just out of sarcasm, but in sincerity. You shouldn't be bothered by it. There's no angels in heaven that are saying, oh, we're getting a bad rap. Oh, Pastor Price is abusing us. There's no angel that's bothered by it tonight. No angel in heaven. No angel of God. Every angel of God says, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill to men. They don't say, you know, men ought to recognize us. No, they say, glory to God. And that ought to be our conclusion this evening as well. Glory to God. Because Jesus Christ is better much better than the angels. Father, thank You for the Word. Thank You that it's steadfast, and that there's justice and recompense and reward. But God, help us to be warned by the false worship of angels and the danger that comes in it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for your good attention tonight. We're going to take uh, just a moment for some prayer requests. Yeah, so let's, let's take a minute to do that, shall we?